morning once again, and welcome to today's webinar on effective communication strategies presented by Yoon Her and Cynthia Perthius of the Alzheimer's Association. My name is Natalia Rodriguez, and I am the bilingual education specialist here at PSS Circle of Care. To give you a little bit of an overview of Circle of Care, we are an innovative multi-service agency whose mission is to strengthen the capacity of older New Yorkers, their families, and communities to thrive. PSS Circle of Care provides free support for those caring for someone who is frail, chronically ill, or is experiencing memory loss, and for families where a grandparent or a family member other than a parent is raising a grandchild. The free or office free services, excuse me, that we offer are consultations, support groups, education and training such as this one, wellness events, respite opportunities, supplemental services, information and advocacy. For further information about PSS and the services we provide, please feel free to contact us at the email or phone number that will be posted in the chat box shortly. Just as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our resources page at pssusa.org forward slash events and on our YouTube channel. Should any questions come up during the presentation, Please feel free to submit them in the Q&A section of your screen for an opportunity to have them answered by one of our panelists during the Q&A portion of this event. So without further ado, we are joined once again by Yoon Her of the Alzheimer's Association and with him is his partner, Cynthia Perthius. So welcome Yoon once again and welcome Cynthia. Um, I'll turn it over to you both for the rest of the presentation. Great. Thank you, Natalia. Welcome back, everyone. Just took a quick look at the participants. I do see some familiar names, so hello, hello. Uh, for those who are new here, welcome, welcome. Um, my name is June. I'm the program manager here at the Alzheimer's Association, New York City chapter. Do a lot of the different education programs, referrals, uh, resource finding, etc. So lots of good stuff that you know we do here at PSS and also at Alzheimer's Association. Um, please feel free, you know, during, as the pro, uh, program goes on, use that Q&A uh, or the chat box function to answer any questions. And at the end, we'll have maybe like 10 to 15 minutes for questions. So those are just some few housekeeping rules. Um, and yeah, let me just hand it over to Cynthia now. Great, Great. thank you so much. Thanks to both of you. I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen. And then I'm going to tell you about uh, a little bit about myself, as well as um, what we're going to talk about today. Let's see, here we are. So today we're going to talk about effective communication strategies. But I want to introduce myself and tell you why I do this work for the Alzheimer's Association. So I, again, my name is Cynthia Perthus. I own a company called Senior Care Authority. And we help people figure out what they're going to do next in life when they have a diagnosis such as Alzheimer's or any other chronic type of disease or just aging. And the reason I got into this business is because my father died with Alzheimer's. And I know that Yoon has heard this story before, but my grandmother died with old timers and my great grandmother died with senility. And we know that all of those were the same thing. They all had a form of dementia, probably Alzheimer's. So it runs in my family and I have what's called an APOE4 gene, which gives me a smidge chance higher than the general population to have this disease. Um, but I want to learn all I can about it and I wanna educate all I can about it. Um, I just remembered that I did not share this appropriately. So I'm going to reshare the screen. I always forget this um, before we get started. There we go. Okay, great. So that's when I'm not working and doing presentations for the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, June, can you see the screen? Uh, you're sharing your... Desk. Got it. Okay, one more time. Let me try this one more time. Third time is going to be the charm here. Sorry. There we are. Great. Now we're here. Um, I do these presentations all the time and I never quite get it right, but that's not Alzheimer's or dementia. That's just stress, just so you know. 
Um, I do a lot of different presentations and I love them all, but my favorite these days is effective communication strategies. And I'm going to tell you that these strategies have been developed by professionals and it's for um, Alzheimer's, but I'm going to tell you there's some things we can pick up on how to communicate with our partner or our friend or, or the general public. So today, our learning our objectives, um, we're going to explore how it takes place when someone is living with any form of dementia, not just Alzheimer's. And by the end of today's program, you should be able to explain the changes that take place throughout the course of the disease. So there's, there's a few stages we're gonna go through. You should be able to decode the verbal and behavioral messages that are delivered by someone living with dementia and respond in ways that will be helpful to that person. And you also should be able to identify some strategies to help you connect and communicate at each stage of the disease. So remember, we're talking about the different stages. So let's talk about what is communication? You know, we know that communication is a number of things. Communication is more than just talking and listening. It's also about sending and receiving messages through your attitude, your tone of voice, your facial expressions, and your body language. Communication is a way to express who we are and how we relate to each other. There was a time in my professional life that I really had to go to some classes to learn how to stop rolling my eyes in a meeting because that was communication. And people could tell that I wasn't really fond or keen about what that speaker was maybe telling us. I also can remember from um, as a small child and through my teenage years, especially that I would say something to my mother and she knew that that's not what I really meant. And she would say, I can read it in your face. So we know that no matter where we are in life, that our um, attitude, tone of voice, facial expressions and body language is a way of communicating. And we want to make sure we have that in place. Now, as the brain changes with Alzheimer's disease or other dementia related progression, People lose the ability to speak and decode language in the usual ways. The better we understand these changes, the better we can connect with people that are living with Alzheimer's or other dementias throughout the course of the disease. So let's talk about the changes throughout the disease. Remember what we're going to we're going to always refer to the early stage, the middle stage and the late stage of this disease. And as Alzheimer's disease and other dementias progress, people lose their ability to communicate their thoughts and feelings through words. They also lose the ability to understand the words that others speak to them. However, they still maintain a sense of self and who they are throughout all stages of the disease. And this means that elements of those characteristics that makes a person unique will remain a part of him or her throughout the disease. Connecting with the person's self is key to effective communication. Staying connected and giving him or her a voice as the disease progresses. Now, in the early stages of the disease, there may be just a few noticeable changes in the person's ability to communicate with words, or there may be no recognizable changes at all. Asking the person how he or she would like to be helped with words can be useful in this stage. Language abilities diminish as the disease progresses and communication moves from easy conversation to relying on emotions and the five senses to connect. As care partners and as caregivers, you are the ones who will adjust the ways you communicate and ma maintain connections with them throughout the disease. Remember that the essence of the person continues. We want to always keep that in mind. And we want to respect the person as the adult he or she is and adjust your communication based on what is meaningful to the person today, no matter what the stage. So in the early stage, let's talk about what changes you might see in this early stage, or some call it a mild stage. In the early stage, you may or may not see changes in the way the person communicates. For some people, there may be some shifts in their ease with words or conversations. And some of the most common changes you may notice in the early stage are on this slide. And they include difficulty finding the right words, 
taking longer to speak or respond, withdrawing from conversations, struggling with decision-making or problem-solving, and reacting more emotionally than in the past, or avoiding discussions of the disease and its impact. Whether you notice changes in the way the person speaks or not, communication in the early stage is crucial. This is a period in which everyone involved is adjusting to the diagnosis and is having thoughts and feelings about the changes ahead of them. Remember that denial is a part of the disease for some, while for others, emotions can feel overwhelming. Come to terms with the diagnosis and the emotions you're feeling by talking together and expressing your emotions. This will help you accept the diagnosis, move forward and discover new ways to live positive, fulfilling lives together. Now, in our first video that we're gonna see, Martha Tierney, who's from the Alzheimer's Association Home Office, is gonna tell us about ways to be helpful in the early stages. Communicating in the early stages of dementia with the person with the disease is important. Um, at that time, you still have language as a tool. So you can learn things about what they might prefer as the disease progresses. Uh, for example, as the disease progresses, a person might have difficulty finding words. Caregivers often struggle to know what to do in that moment. Early on in the disease, you can ask. You can say, you know, if you ever have trouble coming up with the word, would you rather that I jump in and give you the word, or do you want me to wait and allow you some time so you can find it on your own? So as, as Martha mentioned, and as we talked earlier, it's good to ask those questions. I have a client who is in the early stages, and he wants to talk about his death. That is what is important to him in these early stages. And he asked me when I'm with him to fill in the words for him. So you can tell that different people will want to talk about different things. And it's our job as the caregivers and their loved ones to ask them so that, again, we can keep within their self. One of the best ways to be sure you are offering the help with communication is to ask them directly. Again, if a person struggles with the right word, would they feel better if you supplied that word or would they like for you to wait patiently? And sometimes waiting patiently is really difficult for us because we're not used to having that pause. We want people to continue their conversation. But I will tell you that if you are patient, they will be able to fill in the word pretty often, fairly often. Keep your sentences direct and straightforward to help the person avoid feeling lost in a conversation. Short sentences can make your meaning clear. Avoid long explanations and take your cue from the person, taking care not to talk down to him or her. I have a client who once said when I was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, all of a sudden, everyone around me, their voice went up an octave, they talked slower, and they were um, talking down to me. So you can still talk slower and with short sentences without talking down to your loved one. It may take that person longer to find words and put thoughts together and express them. So make sure that you allow extra time for conversations so that no one feels pressured or rushed. I say at this period that it's also a good time to allow extra time for everything because everything takes a little longer once you've been diagnosed with this disease. Keep in mind that conversational needs will change over time. And in the early stage, the person with dementia needs to have his or her voice heard. You can help facilitate this when you meet them right where he or she is today, regardless of the stage of the disease. Be sure to include the person in any conversation if, if she or he wishes, especially those that will have an effect on his or her future. Don't make decisions in front of them about them. Make sure that they're included in and make sure that they are empowered and engaged. Now, some other key points that you want to keep in mind are don't make assumptions about their ability to communicate because they have a dementia diagnosis. The disease affects each person differently. 
speak directly to the person if you want to know how he or she is doing. Just like when you take them to the doctor, make sure the doctor is speaking to them about them and not speaking to you about them. Explore which method is most comfortable. And that might include letters or emails or phone calls or in-person conversations. And it's okay to laugh because sometimes humor lightens the mood and makes communication easier. But make sure that you're honest and frank about your feelings. Don't pull away. Your friendship and support are important to the person with dementia. Now, let's move to the middle stages. Some of the changes in the middle stages of Alzheimer's or other dementias also affect communication. If you notice some of these changes in the early stage, they are likely to become more pronounced as you move, as this person moves through the stages. Some of the changes you may notice are again listed here on this slide. Increased difficulty finding the right words. Using familiar words repeated, repeatedly. Inventing new words to describe familiar things. So some people will call, um, I've heard someone call a watch or wristwatch as a hand clock because those are two words that they know it's that it's got, it, it's a clock and it goes on your hand as opposed to the wristwatch. They also may easily lose their train of thought. They may speak less often and they may communicate through behavior rather than words. Some other um, changes that you might see are difficulty organizing words logically and reverting to speaking in a native language. Some people um, with Alzheimer's or dementia will go back to their first language, and if it's not English, they may forget English altogether. So you need to be prepared for that, especially when you're trying to find caregivers to make sure that they have the ability to communicate in the native language. Also, we see in this stage that people um, with the disease may use curse words, words they've never used before. You've never heard them used before. Um, I tell the story that my father, who was a very conservative Southern Baptist gentleman from Texas, used very salty language when he was in this stage. And his two daughters, myself and my sister, became just uh, uh, outraged and just were so embarrassed by what my father said. And we did some research and found that it was was very common with this disease. So anything that you see or hear, hear, don't be embarrassed, don't be upset by it. Just know that it is a part of the disease. And also in the middle stages, people have a tendency to rely more on gestures than they do um, on speaking. They'll also have difficulty following a conversation as well as a TV program. And they are having difficulty decoding what others are saying, understanding what it was that they said. Changes in the brain make tracking and decoding words more difficult. For that reason, people begin to use behavior to communicate more often in the middle stage of disease. It's a frustration as well. So next, we'll discuss the adjustments you can make to help you continue to connect with people living with the disease of Alzheimer's or another dementia. Also note that some physical conditions and medications can affect a person's ability to communicate. If these changes occur suddenly or dramatically, make sure you talk to a doctor because there could be a medical issue that needs to be addressed, such as a urinary tract infection or the side effect of a medication. Now, in our next slide, we're going to have a video, and this is Beverly, and she is going to give you some advice that caregivers and, and, and from a support group facilitator. I would advise couples, and I usually do advise the caregiver who comes to the group and is caring for a spouse, that you take your time. Always count to three before you respond because it gives you time to think about your answer and what's going on. Generally, in a marital dispute, it's quick. It's back and forth. You're quick to give an answer. When they've been diagnosed, to sit back and say, okay, you're supposed to be the one that's reasonable here. Let's change how we do this because there's only one thing you can control, and that's you. You cannot control them and their process. 
So remember that you need to take your time responding to someone with dementia. And you know that you cannot expect the person living to behave as they might have in the past or to have a reasonable response. So if communication of yours isn't getting the desired response, you should probably focus on what you can change and in what you're doing to alter the situation. Now let's talk about some ways to communicate during the middle stage. Remember to approach the person gently. Identify yourself and approach the person from the front at eye level. Call the person by name and say who you are in relation to the person. With my father, whenever I would see my father, I would say, hi, it's Cynthia, your daughter. And he would also always say, I know who you are. I know. But it's not the way to come in and say, hey, dad, do you know who I am? I always introduce myself with my clients, whether I see them every day or I see them once a week or once a month. I introduce myself. Hi, it's Cynthia. I'm a friend of your daughter's and I'm here to help you. It helps orient the person and helps get their attention. Don't come to them from behind either because it will frighten them. Sometimes using touch can show that you care, even when your words are about a task or are not understood. So a gentle touch can also help get a person's attention. I sometimes will hold my client's wrist, just touch their forearm, say, hello, Sue, it's Cynthia. I know your daughter. She asked me to come by to check on you just to make sure that she's connected with me. Don't criticize, correct, or impose your perspective. It will backfire most of the time. So pay attention to your facial expressions and tone of voice. Be calm and patient. The person can feel your tension or your patience. And finally, remember to take the time. We've, we've said this before. We're going to say it multiple times. Give yourself and the person you're talking with enough time to respond, interact, and connect. And we're going to have another video, and this is from Rebecca, and she is going to talk to you about how she had to adjust her own thoughts and responses when her mother would repeat herself. She could sense my frustration because occasionally I would lose my patience and I, I would bark at her. Why are you asking me that question again? I just answered that question two minutes ago. And then she would get frustrated because, you know, she was very old school and she's like, don't disrespect me. And I didn't ask you that question two minutes ago. It's a new question. So phase two of our relationship was like, okay, that's a new question. I'll answer it again. So it can be frustrating when someone living with dementia repeats questions, statements, or behaviors. I can give you an example. Um, I have a client, both the husband and the wife have Alzheimer's and they both live in a community where I go to see them pretty regularly. And when I was there last week, I went in and he was, as to use Rebecca's term, barking at the staff and saying, my wife needs some food, feed my wife. And the staff wanted to say and did say, she's already eaten. And we don't need to feed her. She's already eaten. She's already had her meal. And he was very upset. And I came in and there was this upset going back and forth. And I came and sat with him. And I said, talk to me about how your day was. I distracted him. I moved him away to something else. But I also asked the care staff to just get her a simple piece of toast and a cup of hot tea. So that while she didn't have to eat it, he felt comfortable that there was food there, even though she had already eaten a full meal. It's much easier to talk with him and help him get comfortable with what was going on and then change the topic to something else as opposed to arguing with him that he'd already that she'd already eaten. It's just a piece of toast and a cup of tea. It's not going to uh, break the bank and it's not going to cause any problems. Now, in the middle stages, when you join the person's reality, so I joined his reality. He said she hadn't eaten. I didn't argue with him. I said, let's just get her some food. You take a little time to see the world as he or she may be seeing it right at that moment. When seen from his or her perspective, the person's behavior can often become understandable to you. In his case, in this case of the man and the woman, the food was out of sight. For him, it was out of sight, out of mind. 
He didn't see any food there. He thought she hadn't eaten. Due to the changes to the brain that accompany the disease, the person will probably not be able to see your perspective. So you'll be the one who will need to use respect and empathy to see the world through his or her eyes. Joining the person's reality is key to helping the person have his or her say, and it provides soothing and reassurance to do this. Um, you might want to take some of the steps that we see here on the slide. So listen to figure out what the person wants or needs. This means paying attention to both the words and the behavior of the person. Keep in mind that the person may be saying something about his or her feelings or needs, but may be feeling something else on a deeper level that also needs attention from you. For example, the words, I can still drive just fine, may also contain the feeling, I don't want to give up my independence, so don't take that from me. The words, stop taking over my life, I hate it, may, may actually reflect the meaning I hate this disease and I don't understand what I can't do, what I always used to be able to do. Let the person know you understand what he or she may be feeling and why, whether they are expressed through words, behavior, or both. Answer any questions or address any issue he or she may bring up. And also be brief and to the point. Most importantly, respond to the emotions behind the behavior or the concern. For example, if a person is communicating with words, you might say, you seem sad. Do you feel sad? And then wait for a response. If the person says yes, you might want to guess what the cause is. Do you miss the way things used to be? If the person says yes, you can say, I do too. You can, you can commiserate with them. If the person is communicating with behavior, hitting out, striking, um, yelling, running. Um, you can identify and speak about that emotion behind the behavior. If the person is rummaging through possessions, it may be a way of communicating boredom or needing something. Hitting during bathing can be a way to say that the person feels too hot, too cold, too uncomfortable, too embarrassed with being naked and feeling out of control. Now, finally, only after you've responded to the emotion, reassure and redirect the person by encouraging him or who, her to do something that may shift the person's thinking and behavior. So to continue the example, you could say, I'm glad to be with you today. Let's go walk outside. In this way, you're gradually moving the person from feeling sad to doing something active that can lift his or her spirits. So con to connect, just as a, another, another reminder here, slow and basic. Be patient and take your time when you communicate. The more you slow down, the less resistance you will encounter because the person won't feel rushed and unable to keep pace. I have a client I'm picking up today to go to a support group, and the support group starts, starts at three. I know that if it were just me, I could leave the building where my client is located and I could be to that support group in 20 minutes. However, I'm going to pick him up an hour ahead. Worst case is we drive through Starbucks and get some coffee to go with us to the support group. Um, probably the real case is that he's not going to be ready when I go to pick him up and he's not going to walk as fast as I walk. And it's going to take him a little more time to get into the car. And there's going to be some confusion that I'm going to have to talk with him about. That's the real case is probably how it's going to be. So I need to set aside an hour to be with him. Rushing leaves a person feeling frustrated, inadequate, upset, and then they get resistant and they say, I'm not going. So the more you take the time, the more you can avoid frustration. Use short sentences, basic words, and speak clearly. It sometimes helps to offer the choice you think is best at the end of the sentence. So for example, rather than asking, what would you like for breakfast? That is a loaded question full of bombs. You could say, it's breakfast time. Would you like eggs or oatmeal? We see this also with, we're going to go out. Would you like to wear this jacket or that jacket? Just giving them a choice. And both of the choices are good. Oatmeal and eggs are good. And a jacket, either way, is good. 
Give multiple cues. It's helpful to give the person many different cues as you communicate. This reinforces your words and clarifies your message. Provide virtual cues and gestures and avoid sudden movement. Use gentle gestures and pointing. Um, again, just be avoid making sudden gestures because it can startle the person you're with. Write things down for the person. Remind your notes, calendars, labels, and list can remind the person of where things belong, what is to be done, or who is who in the person's life. Labeled photos can help the person keep track of names and relationships um, in this middle stage. And then also offer answers in your questions. So it's much easier for someone in the middle stage to choose what to eat for lunch if the question is not open-ended. So you could say, I'm making sandwiches for lunch. Would you like ham or turkey? And then the person can choose, but maybe they can't choose. So you might say, how about ham? And the answer is probably going to be yes. When I went to a restaurant with my father once, and it was a restaurant with a massive menu, and it was before I really understood Alzheimer's, and the waitress came to the table and she said, what would you like? And he said, well, ladies first, she can order first. And I ordered tacos. And when they came to my father, he said, I'll have what she's having. So we both had an order of tacos. When I went home and called my sister, she said, where did you go? And I said, we went to this restaurant. And she said, well, they have that big menu. What did daddy have? And I said, we had some tacos. She said, he hates tacos. And I said, oh, you know, now that I think about it, he does. But that's what he ordered. And she said, tell me how that looked. I said, we ordered what I was having. And we realized it was because he could not figure out what he wanted himself. The menu was too overwhelming. Repeat questions and information. You know, although you may have these reminders, plan on needing to repeat the information you provide on your reminders or questions that you ask. The person may not have been able to decode your messages completely the first time. So repetition can help. But don't say, I've told you this three times. I can't tell you again. You may have to tell them five, six, seven times. Turn negatives into positives. So if you need to get the person in a shower and they always resist, rather than saying it's time for your shower, you might say, let's go get you cleaned up for the day. So be ready for Cindy's visit this afternoon. So you're not using the word shower, but you're also saying the reason we're going to do this is because Cindy who is your daughter, is coming over to see you. And don't quiz the person. Um, don't ask them to try harder to remember or saying that he or she knows the answer and ask the person to think again. Trying harder just leads to frustration. It's much more respectful and helpful to give the person the information that she needs, he or she needs for a task along with reminders. I always say that the curse word in Alzheimer's is using the word remember that you don't want to go in and say, remember, this is your sister. Remember, this is your friend that you play golf with. Remember, we're going to the store today. Remember, it's time for us to eat. Those words should be put away and not talk about remember with as, the, as a question. Respond empathetically and reassure them. Let them know that you are here and that you are listening and that you hear their concerns. The facts are far less important than the person's feelings and his or her view of reality. These feelings and perspectives are very real to the person, even though they may not match your reality. Responding to those feelings first can help avoid resistance. Provide reassurance that you are together and safe and that you are here to help and let the person know that you hear and understand the thoughts and feelings that he or she is experiencing. So long as there is not a safety issue, agree and go with the flow and find common ground wherever possible. And then make adjustments and redirect to another activity if needed. So let's talk about communication in the late stages. In the late stage, the person may only use a few words, but he or she still needs to connect and communicate. Since the person has lost many functions um, by the late stage, you may feel, to feel a strong urge to do something for them. But usually your presence and connection is much more important than doing specific things. Remember that this person is an adult 
with a sense of self that continues throughout all the stages. You can connect with these aspects by remembering the person's history and respecting his or her preferences. The goal is to help the person feel content. Keep talking using familiar words, names, phrases, poems, passages, or songs. And whether you get a direct response from the person or not, the sound of your voice helps maintain the connection between you. And use the five senses. It's a great way to connect with a person who's living with dementia. I have a client who loved Ireland. And every time I went to see him, I went to see him once a week. And every time I would say, tell me about Ireland. And he would talk about Ireland. Now, he was right before the late stages. So he still had what, uh, what would be considered sensical speaking. And he would talk about Ireland. He would talk about his family. And I would use the who, what, when, where, and how. He would say, I went to Ireland. And I would say, how did you go? And he would say, I went over on the Queen Mary. Um, I don't know if any of the stories he told me had any semblance of truth, but it was a way for us to talk about something that he found exciting. I also have a story about a client in the late stages who did not speak. And I was in a community where he lived and they had us in a circle and we were playing the hokey pokey or doing a balloon toss. And they turned the music off and they said, we're going to go around the room and we're going to say something that we're happy about. And we went around the room and when it came to Tom, I thought, Tom doesn't talk. Tom doesn't speak. But the person who was the director gave Tom the space to speak. And the person before him had said, I'm grateful for friends. And they said to Tom, Tom, what are you grateful? And someone in the room said, he doesn't speak. And the director said, we're going to give him a minute. And it was an unbearable minute. And Tom said, friends. So maybe he had repeated what he'd heard before. Maybe that was what he was grateful for. But it was a real eye opener and game changer for me to know that Tom had something inside that he wanted to say. And all we had to do was give him a little time. Now, we're going to see a video from Sandra, and she's going to talk about her mother's late stage and how she connected with her mother in the late stages. I know that my mom feels aggravated. I know that she feels alone. I know that she feels confused. And I know on any given day, I don't know if I've made it better for her. I try. In these later stages, I've come to recognize that being really aware of the five senses is really important. Touch seems to give her a great deal of comfort. I know when I come over, I'm going to brush her hair all the time. My husband noted to me recently, he said, you know, you should see the look on your mom's face when you're brushing her hair. She's just happy. She's just happy. She doesn't say a lot. And I do it for a long period of time. I comb it, I braid it, I do funny things with it, but it just allows me to just be with her in a way that makes her feel comfortable. So let's think of some ways that we can connect through touch. Um, feeling different fabrics is a way or identifying shapes by touch. Uh, I use lotion um, and sometimes lotion that has rosemary or lotion that has peppermint. I like to put lotion on my client's hands, male or female, we put lotion on. Um, identifying everyday items in a bag, uh, visiting with animals. The animal that is the most popular with my clients is a bunny rabbit of all things because it's a big rabbit and they love to pet the bunny uh, rabbit and feel that soft, soft fur. Um, clay or Play-Doh is something else you can do. And also just holding their hand or stroking their arm or back, or as, as Sandra talked about, brushing her mother's hair. Good things through touch. Let's talk about sight. Here's some of the ways that you connect through sight. Um, we can laminate brightly colored pictures to look at together. So a lot of times, I use old magazines that um, National Geographic magazines, if anybody has seen one of those in a long time, it doesn't matter how old they are. It has really bright pictures that you can also talk about. And you can say, oh, this is a picture from someone in Tasmania. And I've never been, but I think it would be a fun place to go. And I think it's hot there and the water seems to be beautiful. It gives you something to look at and talk about. 
Videos of animals and nature and travel are always good. My father loved to watch Anthony Bourdain and his traveling around the world and eating weird things. And my father would tell me stories about how he'd been, when he remembered when he was in Madagascar, where he had never been. And we would talk about those stories and we would watch those, those shows together. Birds and aquariums are always good. Painting with watercolors, you really just can't mess up a watercolor. And then also going outdoors or sitting by an open window. Vitamin D is great. The sunshine, the breeze, the smells, the sounds of nature are all good things to help in, con in connecting through sight. And now let's think about sound. Um, using sounds or music is some of the most powerful ways to connect in the late stage. So listen to familiar music. And it doesn't matter if it's your kind of music. Find out in those early stages, know your person. And, and if it's your spouse, your partner, you may know what kind of music they have. And put together a, um, uh, a PlayStation that has uh, jazz, big band, hymns, classical music pieces, whatever was their music. Also, you can do recordings of the sounds of nature that we just spoke about. Farms, cities, animals, babies, little toddlers. Um, use musical instruments, and then you can identify those musical instruments by the sound. Listen to songs or speech in the person's native language. And just read to that person books, poetry, scripture, newspaper articles. Um, I have a, a friend whose husband had Alzheimer's, and in her late stages, she would read the entire New York Times and the Wall Street Journal to him because that's what he had done. Um, when he was younger, before dementia, before Alzheimer's, he read those papers. She loved to read them. So why not just read them out loud to her husband and let the person hear a gentle tone in your voice, but not angry or frustrated or sad tone in your voice. Let's think about smell. Um, you know, the sense of smell is one of our most basic senses. And although it may diminish with age and the disease progression, Consider using some of the ideas on this slide to connect with the person. You could make take a small plastic bag and put things in there that someone could smell, like herbs or cotton balls with essential oils, um, grass clippings, flowers, coffee beans, some different teas. Again, as we mentioned earlier, use lotions that have some smell to them. Um, make sure that they're not too strong, but be very careful. Um, and also with maybe candles, you could use the scents from candles. But also remember that some people have allergies and they may have to avoid those scents that aggravate them. So be careful. And um, last but not least, let's talk about how to connect through taste. Well into the late stages, people living with dementia enjoy tasting favorite foods and flavors. My friend who read to her husband, she also brought him a little bitty pieces of watermelon every day. He loved watermelon and he would just open his mouth for her to feed that watermelon to him. And she could see the joy that he had with the watermelon. Um, however, as the ability to swallow diminishes, you have to be careful and watch for choking as a hazard. So make sure that you're providing only what the person can swallow safely. Maybe your favorite foods that you could bring in, some home-baked things, popsicles, flavored drinks, ice creams, puddings. So let's review and think about the communication that we've talked about in all stages of this disease. You want to maximize your communication or your connectedness with the person who lives with dementia and involves adhering to just a few principles that we've talked about. What I love about the Alzheimer's Association is we tell you what we're going to tell you, and then we tell you, and then we tell you what you told what we told you, because we know that sometimes it takes many ways and many um, times to hear and understand. So understand what is and isn't possible to change by understanding all you can about the disease and coming to a, a presentation like this helps you understand the disease. Stay up to date with the latest information and scientific breakthroughs by attending workshops and conferences, and know and accept the cognitive and functional limitations of the person and, and set some realistic expectations for them. Remember, your person is an adult with a sense of self that should always be respected. 
Remember to use feelings to connect. And you can also convey your mood, remember, through tone of voice and the look on your face and the way your body is held. Stay focused on your positive feelings for the person. Demonstrate your caring to them and listen, observe, and try to decode what the person is communicating about his or her needs. By joining the person's reality, you can better understand what is needed and how to intervene. Communication evolves throughout the stages of Alzheimer's disease, and adapting to those changes requires commitment, and it requires a lot of patience and understanding. So by adjusting your communication as the disease progresses, you can connect deeply to your loved one. Now, in this video, we're going to have Dr. Sam Fazio, who's going to describe the multiple effects of not caring for yourself as a caregiver. Taking care of yourself while you care for somebody with the disease um, not only impacts your own health, but it really can impact the person with the disease. So, for example, if you're not getting enough sleep, you might be easily irritated, which will then um, sort of spill over to your interactions with the person with the disease and, and maybe being short with them, which then might cause them to get frustrated. So it's not only important to take care of yourself for your own health, but really for you to really be a good caregiver. So it seems like that from what I heard, there's a lot of people on this call that maybe have come to our other, other presentations from the Alzheimer's, but we want to talk to you about it again. There is a 24 seven helpline and that helpline is not just for people who have dementia. It's also for their caregivers. And as a caregiver, you need to take care of yourself so that you can take care of the person you love or that you're with. So when you contact this helpline, it's confidential and there are master's level consultants that can, can give you decision-making support, crisis assistance, and education on issues that families face every day. You also can learn about symptoms and other diseases through this. So this number, 800-272-3900, um, is also there in more than 200 languages, and it is 24-7. And if you have um, need some help with hearing, you can get access through 866-403-3073. There are free online learnings, um, such as what you've heard today, that you can go and find on alz.org education. And we also have a community resource finder where you can visit and find different things that you need if you need care at home or medical services, housing options, programs, community services. And ALZ Connect, so alzconnected.org. This is a place for where there are forums. There are other people who are online that have message boards. There's about 50,000 members who share on this, and it's very um, supportive and very helpful. And then last but not least, the Alzheimer's Navigator. It's a free online tool that helps guide you to answers that you may um, need help with and help you create a personalized action plan. All of these are great things for the Alzheimer's Association. And it's um, one of the many reasons why I do my volunteer work with them as well. So now we're going to move to questions. I'm going to stop sharing. You feel free to put your questions in the chat. Um, or let Natalia know, and I think she can unmute you and you can ask it in person maybe. Um, any fantastic. questions about, about communicating effectively with someone with dementia diseases or Alzheimer's? You're gonna make me feel like I've given you everything you could ever know and want to know and that you just, how could you ever have a question? But um, I'm sure that there are some. There's one that just came up and it says, can you do, can you reiterate the piece where you mentioned about um, this is the person's daughter? Yes, um, I always recommend and the Alzheimer's Association is, is in this camp and this is where I learned it, that you introduce yourself when you go in. Um, that you, uh, even if you're a spouse in the late stages, you're, if you're, if your loved one is living someplace, 
then my clients, we recommend that when they go to see them in the in their place where they're living, whether they're living in a skilled nursing or they're living in a memory care community, or that when they come in, they say, hi, I'm Cynthia, your wife. And we've never had anybody say, I know exactly who you are. Stop introducing yourself. They usually will nod and say, oh, I know, I know. But you don't want to start off on the back foot, if you will, of going in and having them not know who you are, because it's it's devastating for you as the spouse or the loved one, and it's um, uh, it's devastating for the person when you tell them. So I always introduce, or I say, um, even if you use it as a game, hey, it's your wife Cynthia. I'm in here again today. You know, it's it's my third visit today. Cynthia is always here. I just use the name so that they don't have to search for it and they are more comfortable. Ah, I see one here. How can you discuss a parent's affairs, assets, insurance, without seemingly probing into their personal affairs? Um, I'm going to talk about this in two ways. One would be that this person is either doesn't have dementia or is in the early stages. Okay, so that's going to be one way of when you're speaking about the affairs. And then there's going to be a way after that, which is in middle stages, late stages, that's a different way. So in the beginning way, um, I recommend that you do it slowly. It's not, um, I'm coming over and we're going to sit down. And we're going to have a discussion. We're going to get your will in order. We're going to get your power of attorney. We're going to get your healthcare proxy. That they are small conversations that you go as far as you can go, but you have a plan. And the plan is, um, I'm not an attorney, but I will tell you that the most important thing that you can have for someone who either is um, of clear mind or someone who maybe is in the early stages is a power of attorney. It's not about the will. It's not about the healthcare proxy. Get a power of attorney. And so that might be the first thing you're going to talk about. And what you want to think about when you're having these discussions about their affairs is you know your parent. What are they going to be upset about in having those conversations? Do you come from a family that never talked about money? You don't know how much money they have. You don't know how much money they made. You don't know what the cost of their home is. Those are difficult discussions because that's who your parents are. So you want to go in and have this discussion that starts with, I know you don't like to talk about money. What I want you to understand is that I'm not here to take your money and I'm not here to spend your money. I'm here to make sure that you have the care that you need if something happens to you. And that something happening to them may not be getting old, may not be getting a disease. It may be getting hit by a bus out in the street. And that's what you need to help them understand that this is an overarching um, way to work together with them, not because they're old. You don't want to say you can't keep up with your money. You have been losing money. You are um, ill-equipped to do this. You want to talk with them about um, how you're there to help them. And you just do the bite-sized pieces. Don't overwhelm your parents. If you're in the middle to late stages and you haven't had this discussion with your parents, um, you need to find an attorney and you need to find an attorney fast because they are... They are crossing a line where they cannot make decisions. And if you don't have the proper paperwork in place, you won't be able to make decisions for them or help them. And it may be too late to get the proper paperwork in place. So it's touchy feely. It's give or take there. So it's just according to what the stage is. Does that help, Carlton? I mean, does that help? Do you have a, any, you want to ask anything further about that discussion? It's, it's not always a pleasant or fun discussion to talk about your parents as you're becoming their parent. That happens whether they have dementia or whether they just get older. We, we sometimes have to flip that script and we have to become the parent. And that's not always good. Parents are proud. Parents want to be independent. Um, I find that if you come to them and say, lay out some things and say, the reason I'm having this discussion with you is because Mrs. Jones, the neighbor, fell or got hit by a bus 
and her daughter didn't have anything put together. And it was a real nightmare to try to find ways to care for her the way she would have wanted to be cared for. So blame it on somebody else. Blame it on the neighbor. Blame it on somebody at church. Tell a story around why you're having the discussion. Well, thanks for your time. And thank you so much to PSS for having me. And thanks to June for keeping up with me and putting up with my technological issues that I have sometimes. Um, so I'll keep plugging away. I love to talk about Alzheimer's and dementia. I love to talk about how to help people with that disease. And Cynthia, thank you so much um, for coming and for sharing with us. It was definitely very informative and eye-opening. Um, um, and also June for introducing us to Cynthia. Um, at least me, <laughs> I'm new to PSS <laughs> as well. Um, but uh, apparently you're an old friend of ours, so good to know. Um, just want to also thank our attendees for spending your morning with us. And I want to remind you of um another uh webinar hosted by the Alzheimer's Association on December seventh. That will be on healthy living for your brain and body. So you will receive further information on that on the following uh, on the follow up email. So uh, thank you all once again. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, June. And we'll see each other next time. Have great. a great rest of your morning.